Good morning and welcome to LARP Adaptations. Uh, we're not very many here today, so feel free to like ask it so, so you, since you're up this early to watch it, um, so you get you like get to figure out what you want to know, so you don't leave here with unanswered questions. So you like figure out everything. So adaptations. Yeah, and who am I to speak about that? I'm the Rubicon Guest of Honor this year, and these are some of the LARPs I made. I like to work with adaptations in the sense I've done LARP from plays, I've done LARPs from books, and I've done LARPs from music. The last one being the ABBA LARP. So, those examples will come back. So, that's me. So, let's go into this adaptation, the more exciting part. What is an adaptation? And it's basically when you take something from one medium to another. But I did read some in like literature studies about this, but it seems to be there's no like clear definition exactly what, how much you need to keep and so on. But that's the kind of basic one. So, if you do it from like a book to a film or something, it's an unparticipatory medium. So it's still like, it follows some rules. But then if you're going to take it to a LARP, then a lot of other stuff happens because in a LARP people are, you know, participating, they're there and they're going and so on. So that's another kind of thing. And there actually is actually a person, Professor Evan Turner from the US, and he tried to make definitions on this, how to adopt like a book or something from a, to a LARP. And he made these three different types. I feel they call it Bruskin and Hybrid and Strict. And I thought those were okay, but I think the names are kind of bad. So I renamed them and this is my contribution here. So to make it clearer, so the setting is his equivalent of reskinning when you take the setting and adopt it into something else. And then we have the characters, where you take the characters of the story and adopt it. Or when you take the story. So these are the three different types of adaptation I will be talking about. How to like take them. Okay, so we'll begin with the setting. The setting is what's happened most of the time when we adopt a book into, for example, a LARP. Um, and these are the teachers of College of Wizardry. Uh, and College of Wizardry is a good example of that. College of Wizardry don't have Harry Potter or the Harry Potter story, but they have the world and the castle and the like, the setting, so to speak. And there's been a lot of LARPs like this. Monitor Celestra, who took the setting of Battlestar Galactica, Fire with the Manor, Cowan was a Swedish LARP, who adopted some witch TV series, I think, and I'm sure you can think about something yourself. It's usually like, oh, have you heard about this? Um, so you basically take just the setting of the thing and fill it with new characters, new stories, and so on. And then, of course, you can take the characters, I think that's mostly done on a more kind of private level. When I go to this to this LARP, I, I'm being inspired by Arya Stark from Game of Thrones to my character. But there are, I played con convention LARPs, which says, yeah, this is the kind of detective meeting. You're Sherlock Holmes, you're Agathon Sachs, you're, I don't know, the detectives, and then you go around. I, fi I never kind of played... I find it kind of hard, those LARPs, because there's a bit... So I'm Sherlock Holmes and you're, I don't know, another great detective, James Bond, maybe not... It's early in the morning, but we're going to try to have, have a good conversation here and sometimes it gets a bit... Yeah, it doesn't really flow. But it has been done and it can be done, like mix. So, we have a question. Um, one uh, example, um, I, I was wondering if this falls into this category. Uh, I've been in LARPs where there have been different characters from different books and movies and so on, and for some reason they suddenly are placed in uh, like a tavern somewhere in the edge of the 
with Will or something like that. And then there's like uh, characters from like this world, from Hunter, from TV series, and and then they're there. And then those those other characters, they are just like different setting. I would say this fall definitely under this kind of you, you steal the characters and then you put them somewhere or steal is sounds like it's a bad thing i i encourage stealing in this way but like you borrow ideas from here and you like this and yeah i would love to hear because i need a good example for this so that's a good example for like the characters and then of course we have the story that's the last part, part the story and here evan has a lot of text but I'll let you read it. Yes. So he basically played one of my LARPs or one of my freeform games, that Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen, or by, by her, but then by me. Uh, and that, that is, I have taken the story. If you want to know how it ends, read the book. I have like taken it straight off the page. And um, on this, he was impressed by. And then, yeah, then you kind of use the story as it is. Uh, I will go into more detail how I did that. You can steal that idea. So this is the kind of story where you take the actual story of a book. And we will talk much more about this because I think this is the hardest one and maybe the most interesting one. So, so we had three different types of adaptations. The story, the characters and the setting. And I will say I have here Harry Potter. So we have adopted Harry Potter's setting a lot. What would it be if we instead took the story of Harry Potter? Would we play like remove the magic and play like, I don't know, a game in the 1950s about this war traumatized boy dreaming or I have no idea. But like it's a different, you need to think different. Like, okay, the setting is the castle and so, so what is the story really about? Um, and a nice evening was a LARP I did that was based on, for example, the play A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. A Doll's House is set in the 1880s in Norway. So the setting we would take would be this, basically. But now we didn't take the setting. We took the story and placed it in modern time. So it was played more like this in a way. So that's kind of another different, yeah. And the same with a Narnia game. People, I sometimes hear it would be fun to do a Narnia game. And yeah, I'm on whatever that happens. Uh, but should you take the setting and be like, oh, we're out in the, yeah, we're out in some kind of Narnia-esque forest playing something. Or would you want to like depict the story these children go into and how would you want to do that? Now we have a question. Uh, I have just have a comment that there is running some Narnia game in I know that there's there are bundle blocks for these children here and there's a few of my friends who are going to there so I don't think I'm gonna know something from that block and I'm very interested about that. Okay, sounds very cool. Yeah. So this is when I try to look when they're like, yeah, this LARP is, is, is inspired by what comes from, you know, like, okay, what type of adaptation is this? And then of course the R mixtures and the world isn't as sweet and nice as it is in my like engineering PowerPoints, but then you have kind of an, a clue at least to help. What is this? How do it work? So now I will move on and talk about adaptations from story, which I think is the hardest, but maybe also the most interesting that we haven't like mastered. Like adaptations from the settings, we're quite good at actually. Um, so how can you work with adaptations from story and so on? And this image comes from um, the celebration. That was a Danish film that had become a theater play and has also become a LARP. So it's kind of traveled the mediums. So, okay. 
And when you come to story, I would say, because the story is very much, if you want a story, you won't even like the end of it and the details. But if you're a LARP designer, you want people to have their freedom to do what they want. And these two are a bit opposites. So what I will talk about is like tricks, how to tell your story as you want it, but still give the players freedom. Because that's of course a balance. It's like two different things you need to choose. Um, and I enjoy LARPing and working with story because I could say like, okay, so now I want you to LARP. You have every freedom to do everything. And you would be like, yeah, whatever. But if I could be like, yeah, we have this lecture LARP and everyone on this side is evil and that, like, I don't know, would give you something, then you could be more creative and like figure something out. So this is the tricks on how to tell story and till, still have uh, people participate, being participating. Yes, eight in the morning. Okay. How to work with predefined stories. Da, da, da. So I will take a lot of examples here, how it has been done historically um, and what's happening now. And then you, my idea is that you will like take the raisins out of this adaptations cookie and use and see what you like. And I would say the first LARP that started this trend was the LARP of Hamlet back in 2002 because they were going to do the Hamlet saga. And it was apparently so that they got this from like the National Theatre, like, okay, can we do LARP and theatre? So they took Hamlet because it's like the, the play of the place. They were like, yes, we're going as pretentious as we can to prove that LARP is art. So that's how Hamlet started. So what they did was basically they had this, the LARP, and then they had the like main royal family who was people playing like Hamlet, Ophelia, Gertrude, Claudius, and the main characters. And they were scripted. We had, they had like prepped. Okay, so Saturday at three, I come in and kill you, or, and then I tell you you're bad, or whatever, kind of. They even used the lines from the plays, play. And then the rest of us who was in the LARP, we was the court of the, of the Hamlet, or. So we were like playing, yes, we are this noble family, so we're the entertainers, so we're whatever it was. So the LARP would kind of freeze and the light would change when, okay, now we're going to look at the Hamlet's monologue. So the LARP cha the light changed and we all went and like, and from this we, we got like inspiration or we were supposed to get inspiration. So I would say for some it works, for some it was like, I'm in the middle of a LARP and I go and watch someone someone say something in very hard English. Okay, good. I'm back to my LARPing. But it was still, I liked it. Uh, and what they also did, which I think was the first time it was done in like LARP history, was that they started to do acts um, to like help the game. So the first act, which was that the Friday evening, that's decadence. And so you, you will go all out and party and be decadent. And then the second act is intrigue. So now we, I'm going to plot to backstab you and do things. And in the end, it's death. So for the third act, it was like, okay, so think about how your character want to die. You're all going to die. And the instruction was, you know, you don't want to die like heroic like this because it's still Hamlet. Everyone dies in the end. To like die in the most sad, pathetic ways. So people died. And this also kind of gave a story for us that kind of was in the normal LARP. We kind of, okay, we looked what the Hamlet kind of family da did, which some fall close, some a bit on afar. But this was, I think, the real gain here because then they could kind of, the whole LARP was running in the decadence direction, like. And also the kind of rules for violence changed. In the beginning, if I shoot you, it's like, ha ha, oh, I missed, but if you're here, but if you're here, you're dead. Okay, so this was the first kind of story LARP. And the people who played like the main characters, they enjoyed it and wrote about it and were like, this was awesome. 
I know I was going to die in the end, but I, I really enjoyed it. So from this came the next uh, story LARP, which I did, where I, instead of like having the, the Hamlet saga and add the added character, I had the celebration, which Festen, uh, a Danish movie, like Central. So, but I had the idea of like, you guest one, you guest two, you guest three. But then I'm like, no, no, you're the people from a doll's house and you're Miss Julie. So you're, everyone had their own play. And then we played um, during the 60 years of birthday party. That is kind of main story. So it was for like from three to midnight. Was like during acts. And I think, yes, I have. Yeah. So we had still kind of, we had the acts between like, I think, yeah, during the afternoon, four hours, four hours, four hours. We had the same act. And our act was like good, worse, bad. They had fancier names, but this is what I remember now. <laughs> um, so, and the setup was basically small groups. So we could like talk. So, okay, you're Miss Julie, I'm Sean. How should we interact? So, in act one, I'm going to flirt with you. In act two, I'm going to ignore you. And in act three, I'm going to have sex with you or whatever it kind of was. So then you could kind of agree. And if you wanted to know how the story ends, read the play, like, or we actually read the play with the participants before the game. So everyone had read it, everyone know. So, okay, so we're going to pay Nora and Christine Linde, we're going to be best friends, so on. So we kind of took what's in the scene, what's this scene about? They're becoming good friends and rekindle their friendship. And then we kind of ignore the lines, because that's uninteresting to, like, learn lines and be like, ooh, but da but but we took the essence of the play. Uh, and I think the trick was when I choose plays to like, you can't have like, you can't have Hamlet because it's too many characters all over the place. You need it like a doll's house. It's five characters. They're all kind of big. So you don't end up with, yeah, I got to play the messenger. I felt, thank you, thank you, Lark. So, you have to make sure and cut and so on. So we worked with that. And I think the key was here that players got to interpret the materials. So you sat down together and read the story and like, okay, so what's this? How do we do? And so on. So this was actually, yeah, we played plays like LARPs. And I would say it worked very well. People were like happy and so on. And they didn't need to focus on how the story should end. They just focus on how to play it and get the most emotional impact from it. And there's one play we had in the bunch where I think the father is a game addict. And we only had like this horrible place. But anyhow, he's a game addict. And I think in the play, he like loses money once. In the LARP, of course, he lost money, <laughs> you know, a lot of times. So they would loop this thing again. And his wife would be like, yet again. And he would, yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah, yet again. So they do. Um, yeah, so this was story because all of this was about like families, like bourgeois families. So a lot of people afterwards had the discussion about, oh, but in my family it works like this, or I could recognize myself in this character and basically how a family can be nice, but also be kind of destructive. So that was 2007. <laughs> Does it feel clear? Okay, yeah. About the same thing, in Denmark, they did a LARP called Agilburn, something in Danish, and it's an American horror. And instead of we used plays, they used horror stories, and they had like agreed on like scenes. Okay, so at three o'clock, I'm going to go and I'm going to slap you. At four o'clock, I'm going to kiss you. And at five o'clock, I'm going to talk to you about something, something or whatever it was. So they also kind of got this like a bit goal oriented. This is what I'm going for. Uh, yeah. Here's, so we're up to 2007 in the history. We have time. Good. 
Um, so I would like to look, look into about these acts because I've, I'm a big fan of acts because they kind of give a direction without telling you exactly what to do. So we'll look at some acts to tell you a story. And these are two very, very different laws, but they both use act structure. Just a little love in this about AIDS when it came to New York in the 80s. And Fair Weather Manor 1917 is about, it's Downton Abbey inspired LARP about upper class England, basically. So they use this act structure. Uh, Just a Little Oven had three party evenings. So they were like, we're playing this party evening, it's 1982. The theme is friendship, everything is awesome. We're like the first day of the LARP also, we're like establishing that we're awesome friends. Then we break the game for a while. It's been a year, we're 1983. The, the, the sickness, uh, AIDS have come closer, but no one near people have begun to die, but no one really know how it, how it um, ah, moves from one person to another. So we're all paranoid. So we're like, yeah, you're sitting a bit close, or I don't want to drink from the same glass or use the same bathroom and so on. So all of that kind of part. And this was part of the culture and it's been, and here the LARP organizer have like interpreted it. And then of course, Friday, it's here people are really becoming, starting to die. Um, and each breakfast after the kind of party evening, you would um, you would put the number of lottery tickets into a hat, and they would draw who died and who didn't. So it's a kind of it's, but it's a very simple act structure in a way, and it's similar to Hamlet's in the like good, worse, bad. Uh, but it's like easy to use. And Fairweather is a Downton Abbey inspired LARP in Poland that me and my friend, and who played a co-butler, got to put some acts on. And we had fancier names for them, but I don't remember them. So it was basically Friday sad. We put in a lot of like sad events. The Tsar has abdicated. This is sad if you're a noble in Britain. And you're like, oh, can't be good. We had the memorial service in the church. We tried to place every type of event like there. And then, of course, in the story of contrasting love and war, we had Saturday morning happy. So there was the wedding, and we were also like, so how do we, how do we like inform everyone that it's happy? So we were like, can we get cake for breakfast? And they were like, of course you can get cake for breakfast. So we had cake for breakfast because now it was happy times. And we also told this to the players, so we asked them to kind of pace their game, so you can get your personal news about your son being dead and the sad thing, and then be happy, or I don't know. But there was at least, this was kind of, this LARP didn't have it in the design, so we kind of tried to put something on it to give, give it a bit of a story. So that's how it can work. And then Saturday afternoon, yeah, it was the reveal that the bride's father was dead, and all men were called back to the front, so we were sad again. Quite simple, yes. Um, so the, 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 the players, no, their structure, like the players know that on Friday they're supposed to kind of be sad, on Sunday and they're happy and Sunday. Yes, yes. But maybe this was the lot that was enforced on the most, but yes, we told them and tried to, like, okay, so this is volunteer, you can use it on. I, I'm more fan when I do this type of structures, like, this is how we play, this is no volunteer, we're all going to try to strive in this direction kind of get the group to tell the story. But this was like, this is how it be. Then we didn't tell them exactly like, so on Friday the Tsar would die. But we were like, yeah, the Tsar is still there. You, everyone you think is awesome. So anyone who know kind of anything about this period were like, ah, it might show up. So, so we tried to kind of give this with events. Worked okay -ish. I would say in the Just a Little Loving example, it was much more clearer because they as organizers was clearer with it. But it's, so you, you can still do it on kind of, add it on to a LARP, or, but it's better if it's in the sign in the beginning. Okay, so, that's kind of one way 
for a LARP to get the predefined story in. Like the acts are, they're a bit, um, they're not super sharp. I can't be like, yeah, I will guarantee you this experience. I can more be Saturday afternoon, be sad. And then of course, but I still give you some kind of structure. So then there's a lot of freeform games out there and different predefined stories, and they're usually smaller. So I'm going to look at a bit about them and how we can kind of steal ideas from that and imply to our LARPs in the kind of balancing the, the, the story that we want to tell and the power of that participants will want to do what they want to do and not be forced to do stuff or be, don't believe that they're forced at least. Okay. Okay. So what's a free from game? Basically, it's a game set in a classroom. There's often some kind of predefined story and it's like a role playing game. You're like, this is going to happen. Two to three people, two to five people, game master, scene by scene. Like, we play this scene, we play this scene. Okay. So, here is growing up and sense and sensibility. I worked somewhat with Austin and I wrote actually a scenario from sense and sensibility twice. The second time it was better. Spoiler. <laughs> I learned stuff. And that's actually super simple in its structure. It's scene by scene. I have read the books many times and I'm like, okay, first scene, you cry that your dad is dead. Second scene, you're in the library, there's no money, where should you live? Okay, third scene, the young, handsome gentleman show up and so on. <laughs> um, so it's if you read the script, it's very like dun dun dun. Um, and then there's a game master who sets them. And of course, in the like scene where the young, handsome gentleman show up, sometimes the player might not get the super chemistry directly. So you're like, okay, so you're you're in the library talking, and it's kind of nice. One week later, he have read the book you recommended. So you're like, oh, you read the book I recommend. So you can do a bit of scenes to like make them get the purpose. Uh, I also use letters in this. So I'm like, here's a letter. And that was like predefined. I had like physical letters to give. And I would say information design is key, especially when you work with Austin, because she writes a bit like a, um, oh, like, like, a de like a detective story. Like we have the women who like, oh, we're innocent. Everything is awesome. And then they meet... <laughs> Sorry. And then they meet a lot of guys who's like, oh, well, I'm innocent, everything is awesome. And then it's like, oh, oh, here's this dark backstory no one knows about. So then how to kind of get that? So I think that was a bit troublesome working with them. Um, and it's generally when you work with books, because like when you work with LARPs, you want like four characters, everyone is equally important. In books, it's like, yeah, you're super important. You are the rest of you, Mia. But you're important that you come in and do this one scene. And that kind of messes it up. Uh, so that's one, ex like, that's the basic ex example how to make a game from a book. You take it and you have a game master who tells the player what to do. Okay. This is another example the journey. Um, it's basically 26, you get a paper, a bunch of papers, that's 26 scenes. And you like go, okay, we play the first scene. And you turn the page and you're like, okay, so this is what I'm going to do. Then you go up and you play it. And you're like, okay, turn the page, the second scene. Uh, and you play it like that. And this has been awarded prizes so So even if I don't see it in new faces, it worked very well when it was done. Get. And there is a game master who basically just controls the sound and so the game doesn't fuck up. So it hasn't been done with like a LARP this yet, but maybe soon. Okay. This is another type of game you just play two people actually, which makes it super personal. Um, where you, yeah, you have a deck of cards and you you go in and you turn the card and you like read the next instruction from the next scene. Um, here you don't know how the story is going to end either. Uh, and there's no game master. 
Okay, here's another, yeah, another type of game how to kind of get the story out. Instead of having all the scenes in a pile that you kind of turn, they put it on a wall. So you can like, okay, I feel like playing this scene now. So you, the players get to choose. And this is a game about the musician. So of course they use the aesthetic of like the music. Um, and here is also like it's predefined story. We know that he will go crazy and die in the end, and we know that things will happen. And we have like this number of picks to choose from. And the game master didn't pick; we players did. So people stood there like, okay, what, what, okay, this one, yeah. Do you want to do? Let's go. So yeah, and happy ends. Another techniques they. This is the story. You as players get the story. You read it before the game begin, and then the game master says, "So, which scenes should we do in this story?" And you choose a bunch of scenes and you play them. Um, and the rule is here: only play on the joy, because I think when Tobias wrote this, he was frustrated with that we larpers and role players tend to go for the dark scenes and be like, "Yes, I murdered you. Does it feel good?" But here we need to play on joy and positive feelings. Okay, yeah. And now we're coming to the slightly bigger games, where um, Malholan LARP, inspired by David Lynch, Malholan Drive, I think, there you played three people in a group in like your little spot that's surrounded by tape uh, in the floor. So you play there and then there was a game master who said and there were lo lots of group of three and the game was like so the A character in this scene you should go in and slap the B character so all the A characters in the thing they were like yes da -da! or pro possibly with more kind of you know added game to it and since this was Lynch to kind of mess it up of course at some point the game has said, so all A characters take a step to the left. So if you had been my B, now you were my B. And this kind of made it a bit messy, but kind of lynchy, if you're into David Lynch. But it was nice because then he could control um, lots of groups. Like, it was, otherwise I feel free from games, it's usually like you have three people. Now he he could be actually up to twenty, like huge. Yeah. So inspired by this, I did my ABBA game where I used ABBA music. So I listened a lot to ABBA music, and then there is actually a predefined story. It's about a five-person band and their entourage that uh, travel around in a summer tour, nineteen seventy-nine. And we play a party evening in May, a party evening in June, July, August, September. And before, it's very, this is half the script. So the script is about this long. Um, and you don't need to read it all, but kind of gives you an idea. So it's very much like, yeah, in Act 1, A and D should meet. They're going to sing this song and they're going to leave the bar together. So you're going to flirt up each other. Everyone gets this before they LARP. And of course, I designed this to match the songs, the ABBA song. Um, so that makes it like. And I also want to get rid of the game master. I'm like, do we need a game? Do I need to go out there and like, yeah, now it's act two people? So no, I made a movie <laughs> on. So there's actually a film that controls the pacing. So you have it on a big screen, and then you. You're like, okay, so we play Act 1 in May, uh, and then we play a bit of like bar scenes. We're in the bar, we're drinking, we're like, yeah, the tour is going super, hooray for us. And then the light, so this is like, yeah, we're hanging out in a bar. And then the light changed, and we go into singing mood, where we sing. Uh, and then they don't have microphones, but they look at the lyrics here. So they kind of sing out to you, like, oh, I don't want to talk, and so So that's super, like, I haven't used 
like the ABBA song, I made up my own story. So it, the story isn't ad adopted, but I used the ABBA music to inspire me. And I also thought Mamma Mia was a bit too joyful. I think the ABBA music was darker. So this is my ABBA comment. Uh, and the neat thing here was also, of course, that just as in the Lynch game, I have, I had like five A's or something. So U5 was one kind of group and U5 was another. And then I had, so I could take a lot of people in the game, but still I only had five characters. Uh, and then I let, of course, people figure out their names and a bit of kind of ideas around it. So it worked. So it didn't feel like we're the same character, but people add on stuff. So there's also like how to, here was also clear, this is a predefined story. There's no like you can decide your own end, but you still get an idea. Okay, yeah. So this is some examples to work with predefined stories. And I, when I was doing Fortune and Felicity, that was an Austin LARP. I'm like, yeah, we should, Jane Austen, yeah, we should totally work with story. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, we're going to do a nice evening style. It's going to be epic and super good. Uh, and I like sometimes when you do projects, you like think, yeah, it's going to be like this. And when you start looking at the details, you're like, uh oh, this doesn't work. So I run into problems like the Austin books have a lot of characters. They have a lot of minor characters that comes in and say a small thing. Um, and books are long, like players need to own the material to know what they're doing. We actually did a game test when I was like, so in chapter one or in act one, you should do that. In act two, you should do this. In act three, you did, people were stressed out. So people were like, yes, I need to do it. So I think the trick is if you're gonna play according to story, the player need to like own it. So yeah, and also in information design, it's super hard. Yeah, and I also want to like get it in the, the body process. I know what I'm doing, I'm making a choice. So he, in this case, adopting the Austin story straight off didn't work. So you were like, okay, how do we do? So what we did was basically, uh, we introduced like every Austin books, it's basically about six to eight people who do a who takes who game in an English countryside setting. <laughs> Um, so we were like, okay, so we pair people up in groups of eight, um, where we have like, okay, so I have a thing for you, you have a thing for her, you have a thing for her. And like, so we made a circle where everyone like had two connections to also democratically distribute the plot. So we don't have like, yeah, I'm Lizzie Bennett. Like I have four guys who actually like me. Well, you, Charlotte, you, Lucas, you have no one. So sad for you. So everyone had two. Uh, and in this kind of circle, everyone was inspired from an Austin character, but we didn't tell them because we didn't want them to be like, but I'm playing Mr. Darcy, you need to act like this to play me up because but that's not how LARP work. It's like, I'm trying to do my thing. Of course, people saw a bit what it were, but still they were, they became their own character and their own, their own thing. And there was a game master for these groups who kind of helped them to work. And it was transparency. Like we didn't have the secret, you're secretly pregnant, not even I as a play note. So everyone knows all the plot and they know that I'm hitting on you for the money, but my true heart is here or whatever it could have been. Um, everyone was also in the family group, so you had that support. Um, and yeah, we have a bit of predefined events. We know that, okay, in chapter two, this might happen and so on. So, but what we really try to do, and we had some acts to kind of try to, yeah, what we really try to do was like figure out what is Austin about, like, and we came up with the like, so in the beginning, everyone is like, yeah, super romantic and it's awesome. And then reality hits them in a sense, they're like, shit money oh and then in the end they hopefully developed in redemption and like learn and we also got the nice rrr kind of thing so uh, develop or not develop kind of became the question this was a bit complex and i think worked for some but for some they were like yeah i'm austin larping and it's awesome I'm like okay that's good too 
but we had some kind of thought here. So in this case, it didn't really work to take the books kind of right off the page. Like, of course, I had the idea of like, yeah, screw these Regency dresses because that's only cost a lot of money. Let's place it like in a bar in New York. And the question is not who to marry, but who to leave the bar with tonight. And since there's like lots of journalists there, it's like if you live with a like poor, poor person, it's not as glamorous who's leaving with the rich and super popular Mr. Darcy or whatever. So, but here we choose to keep the setting because it's added. So that's of course how you can like think about it. So, um, so this I would say is where the kind of story of story adaptations of LARPs is today. It's not super many that has been done. We had the Hamlet and Nice Evening, and then we had lots of freeform games and people like me who, for example, Fortune Felicity was inspired, but I don't know if it would be a like true ad story adaptation because I felt I couldn't get it in a good way as I wanted. I wanted player freedom. And also when you play on love, it's like, yeah, I'm going to marry you in the end of the LARP and we're going to have super a lot of romance. And I come to the LARP and you smell cheese. And I'm like, Fuck. yeah. So like we needed a bit of mobility for players. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that working from story is fun, but hard because you're forced to ask what's the story really about. Like, Harry Potter might not really be about dragons and a castle. What what is what do I want to convey? Like, how do I want to do it? Uh, but still, I would say work with story is fun. Even if you, when you begin with a story, and then maybe realize it doesn't work, you still have kind of a lot of input there. And of course, yeah, the ever balance, freedom versus predefined. So the players need some freedom, but they also need a framework to kind of like, this is where we're going for. We as, because when you go to a LARP or anything, we as a group in here, we're going to tell the story about this. So this is what the LARP is going to be about. Uh, give the players ownership. You can't like, you can't inst like order them to do stuff on the idea. Like for a nice evening, we let them read the plays themselves, discuss them themselves, and also of course, never count on your players doing anything before the LARP. So we read the plays on location, so they would be like, okay. Um, and transparency, like if you, like I'm part of transparency school because I'm, I'm part of like narrativistic, narrativistic gaming, if you play a game that's a more game mystically oriented, where you might play to win or like, no, then transparency may, might not be the thing. But here, I lie. It's nice that I know that, okay, you're the, uh, yeah, you're my mistress and this is my wife and now you're sitting there making my life hard. Like, yeah, I don't know. You know, you can know stuff and make it better. And again, so to lean on research, Evan Tornay said, like, literature and film, it says, is unrepresented, even if we adopt from it all the time, because we take the setting rather than the kind of story and, like, what's it about? So, but I think it's because it's hard. Like, I've been looking at exams, trying to pull from other Nordic countries, like, what's happening here? Uh, but we still get some. So, that was that. Do we have any questions? Uh, the characters, Fortune and Felicity, yeah. Yeah, I think, for example, the Mr. Darcy guys figured it out. Uh, because it's very clear. He has like 10,000 a year and so on. But we had other characters. What other in the spectrum? Yeah. So some did, and we had basically two characters inspired by Mr. Darcy. One married Elizabeth Bennet, one married Miss Bingley. So it was like people, they owned their story and took there where they wanted to go. I went to Fortune and I think there was a lot of players who did 
coming in a week in the hospital, but then they were like, yeah, they were just the, yeah. They just read the character description and made their own, like, decisions, and some are a little bit confused, like, why oh, is this really? Does, does this one make sense? Because based on the story. And we also had the, the players who, who I'm like, oh, this is super clear. This is totally Maria Bartram. And then they were like, no, I totally played Marianne Dashwood. And I'm like, of course you did. You're the player. I have no idea. So, so they could do use it differently, which was fun. Do you want to do in the future? It's a super hard question, actually. Um, I want to work more with this. Um, and like, yeah go where it smells nice in my best swing list, but you know, very kind of interest. Now I'm in the post-production of Fortune and Felicity in a sense, so I'm sleeping and waiting for this time when I would, you know, when you would suddenly get some time over and you'd be like, wow, I have this new idea, we need to do it like this. So we'll, we'll see. Who people have been the most influential for you in design of Mars? Um, like other game designers, I'm going to say Hamlet, that was done by Martin Erickson, who's here talking about Vampire, was super influential. Um, in the mirror with like chapters, I'm... God, this is a good question, I should have a better answer. I worked, at, yeah, I, I, in the beginning of like 2000, I participated a lot of freeform games that was part of the Jeep collective called Via Åke Jeep with Tobias Vrikstern, those guys. Um, they were like, yeah, I realized then I could get a more magical experience like four hours in a classroom than four days in a forest. So that's when I kind of became into free form and all of this kind of other stuff and meta techniques. And when I did a nice evening, I was like, so we're going to recruit the Jeep people and let them, you know, I, I was just, I wanted to make uh, LARPs from play, how it was going to be done. I had no idea. So I'm like, you guys, you, you have done like magic free form. Come here and tell me and help me. Um, and yeah, I worked a lot with Martin Rotherschilden, who, yeah, he's the non transparency guy. We did a magazine together a long time ago, like transparent, or like he's the transparency, I mean, transparency, no secrets. No sick. So, I think these are kind of where I come from, mostly Swedish, kind of oriented. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I can maybe, I'll think about this. And I also need to, yeah. But it was, I think there's where I come from. So, but I think you have flashed the signs. So, find me afterwards if you want to ask questions and Super nice to have you here so early in the morning and, you know, yay! <laughs> so go out and do LARPs. Thank you.